Hello, winners, and welcome to the Wrong Button Podcast, the show where we talk all things nerd, most things video games, generally anything that tickles our fancy. Even if that fancy is in the middle of a giant star whale. Even if that fancy is in the... Oh, that sounds like it could be dirty. Just a little bit. I mean, hey. Just, uh, anything was, to tank our podcast rating. Anything to tank the podcast rating. It's not going to tank it. It's gonna, we're going to lose that PG-13 rating. People are going to be like, I can't have my kids listening to this. <laughs> Ah, it's fine. It's fine. But uh, welcome, everybody, to Ahsoka's Episode 7, but our sixth podcast. Is that correct, Chris? Yes, six but six. Six podcast. Six but seven. Um, what do you think of the episode? I I loved this episode. I I think that the first, the th- first three episodes were mandatorily slow because... Ahsoka was kind of introduced in the Mandalorian, but it it felt like uh, the Mandalorian when Ahsoka was introduced, it kind of felt like for a lot of people that was the uh, the like early Easter eggs of Marvel days, where it's like, oh, but that's referencing this thing. It that's kind of what that felt like for the Mandalorian, and now that Ahsoka's here and the show is coming out, it felt like the first three episodes had to condense two series into like, Hey, this was also happening. Yeah. And the flashpoints really. Yeah. And then episode, what it was episode four. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Episode five. It, it really, it exploded. Yeah, Death. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens when you insert the chosen one, right? Smack dab in the middle of a, in a series. Yeah. So I'm... Five, six and seven, five, six, seven and eight, I think are going to be like, these massive bursts of how amazing the show really is after a brief bit of setup. Yeah. I think this episode was the most star Wars episode of star Wars episodes. Just that, you know, we got, we got a cameo, which we'll talk about later. Um, a good mix of action, great. character development. Yeah. It was, um, a, it was a, it was a golden cameo, if you will. And, <laughs> got a thank you. Got a little bit of everything in, and um, I definitely thought more so than any other episode, we got to see the rebels' chemistry on full display. So it was great. But well, we opened up. Uh, we opened this episode up in a courtroom, though, which I thought was an interesting start. Yeah, we still don't know how court works in Star Wars. I don't understand how politics work in star wars but that that's a that's a podcast for like a later i was gonna say i actually time. i think there is a a star wars political podcast i know there's at least like a four-hour youtube video explaining the politics of star wars i know that exists out there but i think there is a political star wars podcast which i think is cool um yeah i don't understand how court works especially in in Ahsoka, in this scene, uh, it was great to see Chancellor Mon Mothma. Weird to see her outside of Andor. Um, hasn't aged a day, even though it's been, what, like a solid 15 years since her since her appearance in, in, uh, in Andor, something like that. Yeah, I can, I can. I can see that. I was, I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? She was in Return of the Jedi, and I'm like, oh wait, we're not. Okay, never mind. Yeah, never mind. Um, you yeah, had the wrong button podcast where we commonly questioned the the recent timeline of of Star Wars. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, you know, it. I don't know if I've ever hated a senator so much. Then I hate Senator Ziono. He, every time I see him, I just, I squirm a little bit. Like, if there's any guy who really needs to be punched in the face in this show, it's him. So, as as someone who hasn't watched Resistance, so slight spoilers just to kind of, to, to kind of get us there. Um, in Resistance, because I know you say he's the father of one of the protagonists, and I still haven't watched that series yet, and I probably should just take time and do that um 
is he a bad guy in that series or is he just still slimy? He's just still slimy. Um, he, if I'm remembering, it's been a while since I, I watched resistance. Um, it got canceled after its second season. Uh, um, it, it, it's geared more toward a, a younger audience for sure. Even more so than rebels was, but he essentially is the reason why the main character runs off from home. Oh. So definitely 10 out of 10 bed, bad dad alert, but he makes it, he makes you wonder. And I think Hera had this line earlier in the series of which side did he support during the rebellion? You know, was he just, was he just sitting back waiting to see who came up on top? He's, he's the Aaron Burr esque Senator of the star Wars galaxy. Oh, dear and he's just God. a jerk. Yeah. Um, but I thought overall the whole courtroom scene, it felt like it was lacking a little bit. I thought we could have raised the stakes. Like I know Hera was, was being, you know, she could have been recommended for a court martial and, and all of that, but it just didn't seem like the stakes were high enough. And I don't, I don't know if it was maybe because, they didn't have enough time to really build up her, her discipline, like, you know, like the discipline she would face. Um, but I think it maybe just could have been handled a little, a little bit better. Uh, so I, one, I think a lot of, a lot of how you're going to like, so I'm going to speak of this as somebody from, from like a, a military, the, the military, uh, side of, of things. Um, have you ever seen, um, I think it's, a uh, it's not have you ever seen like a few good men or um oh Jack yeah with, and Tom, with Tom the young Houston. isn't that the one with no that's um full metal what's the one with the uh with a young andrew garfield is that full metal? Uh, that's hacksaw ridge i think oh it's hacksaw ridge ah yes okay uh i haven't seen a few good men okay. maybe i saw it when i was younger it's it's um I've seen clips of it, but I don't recall seeing the entire movie. Yeah, so that's the one with like Jack Nicholson, where it's like I want the truth, and he goes, you know, you can't handle the truth. Oh, right, in a in a young Tom Cruise, right? Very young Tom Cruise. Yeah, uh, yeah. okay. It's it's been a while. I watched it when I was when I was younger. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's that one, and then there's Men of Honor, which is I think a young Cuba Goody Jr., um, where he wants to be a Navy SEAL diver. Um. And that also has uh, somebody else who's really big in it. Uh, everyone can kind of get on me for those. All right. So in, in those movies, they, they show like a, a courtroom where it's like these are highly preceded events, like it's being reported on. And when you get to a certain rank, that is true. We've had instances recently where it's, you know, it's like a colonel or, uh, you know, a, a major, major less so, but like colonel to general stepping down, anything happening to them would be covered by the news. However, what this one is, is like, this is, you know how like occasionally be like, Hey, the, the Senate defense committee met with so-and-so to discuss something today. The yeah. last big one we had was about aliens. Right. And that was highly sensationalized, but so much of it would be like C-SPAN. And unless you went there looking for it, you wouldn't have it. The other thing is it, it's kind of like when they all still say, and it, it makes me cringe now every time, our fledgling, you know, new Republic, they don't have anything like there's no established order. You know, they're like, Hera's still behaving like a rebel. And it's like, well, yeah, that's what she's done for the past 20 years. Now she's telling you there's a problem and you guys are like, but you need to wait and hold for orders. So like her she's being a Fort general. Martin, yeah. Yeah. Uh. She is, but you know, if if you're trying to be like, hey, we're different. We, what it feels like is senators aren't. Senators are elected, but they don't actually have control. It would be the the whoever is the leader of the planet, kind of like Mandalore had a chancellor, and yeah. then it it like I said, the the politics for that is weird. So her being court martialed the reason for me that it really didn't hold any gravity is she's been a rebel and we don't know how the rebels really made money. And I'm betting 
aside from the fact that she now has, you know, uh, Jace to look out for, she like she looked a little distraught. But I'm like, would it actually be bad for you if you, would if it you actually... lost your rank and stuff like that? Yeah, like what 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 would you actually lose other than the fact that it's like okay, now you're disgraced general character. Uh, I think she would end up losing. Um, I don't. I, she would face jail time, would she not? <laughs> Pretty no, sure not, she'd be. Did they not, not always that for a court? Mar- no, it was. It was. She might be court martialed. I don't think they mentioned jail time at all. Um, like typically, like you can be court martialed for like dereliction of duty, but like uh, so for instance, there's a, a famous story uh, covered by Simon Senek, and I'll I'll recap it really quickly for people. Um, but there were two Marine officers who were in like OCS officer candidate school going for uh, a higher rank. And the, he was, he was waiting to, to interview a Marine about like, Hey, how do you guys know who's going to be a Marine? Who's going to be a leader? And the guy comes into the meeting late and he goes, he goes, Hey, I'm really sorry. We've got this really, really tough infraction coming up with us. And, uh, it, it's really weighing on me what to do with the situation. And, Simon Sinek goes, okay, well, what happened? He goes, well, we had uh, two Marine guards that fell asleep on duty. And it, it was over here in the States. It wasn't somewhere where it really mattered. <clears throat> but the guy's like, and I think we might have to to kick one of them out of the Corps, uh, which would be like a full court martial, and then you have a dishonorable discharge. Yeah, okay. And Simon Sinek is like, well, what, what, you know, why, why does it like, that seems really harsh. And he goes, well, one guy said, yes, I fell asleep. We have no issue with him. Uh, and you know, he took his, he took his licks. He got like, he might've gotten like demoted for a couple of weeks, had to do some extra KP duty crap like that. Mm-hmm. But the other guy was like, no, it wasn't me. I didn't fall asleep. And we came to him with all the evidence. And then he finally goes, I have, I am now able and ready to, you know, uh, take responsibility for my actions. And it, it's one of those things where that's the guy they were thinking about kicking out because it's like, no, you need to own up to it right then, not make us prove it. So like that, if that gives you anything, like jail time would be like, hey, I got a lot of people killed. I made an illegal call. We were doing something illegal. But you can be court-martialed and just be like, nah, you you made some bad calls. You disobeyed orders and not necessarily have jail time. Okay, that sorry, that, that makes, was a long explanation. No, it makes a lot. It makes a lot of sense um, in really explaining, I guess, like the, the punishment side of things, and like made an example of for you know because at the end of the day, Hera didn't follow a direct order from her technical superior, which is the Senate. What, what were they? The Oversight Committee is what they that what they were calling themselves. Yeah, that was like the General Senate Oversight Committee. Um. <laughs> Which is different from the gen- the the Senate Defense Oversight. Yeah, committee. I, I, I noticed that too. And I was like, That's, "There's a lot of committees. When did the Senate get so many committees?" Um, I mean, I mean, Harrison Ford, or I'm sorry, Han Solo tells Leia, "We don't have time for you to discuss this in a committee." He even knows how bad it is. Well, I mean, you know, Han's Han's never been the biggest uh, government supporter. You know, I think he. <laughs> I think if you think about Han, he's drank the Kool Aid a lot <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the show. But um, yeah, I just felt that there could have been like maybe a little bit more more to the courtroom scene. I did like the fact that Chopper was ready to uh, throw hands with that senator. You know, when um, when the captain comes in and and Senator Ziono makes that makes that comment of. Like, how are we supposed to trust a mere droid? And he, he's talking to the big cameo of the episode. Uh, you know, three, C-3PO's C-3PO. been sent, com- actually completes his mission for once, by the way. You know, uh, no no side no side travels for our, our wonderful golden protocol droid. But um, I loved how Chopper was just ready to throw hands. Like, he's not going to listen to the droid slander. And so I, I think the other thing that really bothered me is when they were, when Ziono was reading it off, he goes, intergalactic travel, other galaxies, space whales. And he goes, this reads like a fairy tale. But you had three giant Republic cruisers full of people who would have seen that shit. Yeah. 
And it, it's it, not just the report. They all an entire fleet saw it. Yeah. So, I, I your criticism, I think, is is well is well sounded. Um, and also, that, he's that old enough to, he, like, he's old enough to be to know about the Jedi Order, the things that they encountered, all of that, and not just that, but there had to be a full battle report on the Siege of Lothal and what happened to Thrawn in the first place, right? So, like, are you kidding me, dude? Come on. Like, it reads like a fairy tale. Okay, you ah, just... I'm obviously biased against the Senator, and I'm, I'm not going to give him the benefit of the doubt, because you have the materials there to show you that this whole thing reading like a fairy tale is very much real. Yeah. Um, I may, Maybe Lothal, like, Lothal was an isolated incident, and they weren't, like, I don't think it was, like, fully set up yet. So I would understand if, like, Lothal was... Because it's kind of like at the end of... If, if we go to, like, the uh, the Last Jedi, when Luke comes out, and it's like all these people saw him, the First Order would have seen him, but you still have, like, kids doing this embellished version of it with action figures. <laughs> uh, so I, I can understand if maybe, like the space whales things like like we thought that was just wartime propaganda um and yet he probably remembers the jedi but i could also see him like bearing his head to like further him being slimy so that way if he has to switch slide sides he can just be like nom out but yeah like to your point though an entire an entire fleet saw this pod of space whales jump into hyperspace you know like it's not like read the read the mission report, dude. Obviously, it's not just Harrow who who saw this, you know. Yeah, um, he really tried to lay into Hera, and I love the fight that Hera gave back to him. Um, however, I think it was a little anticlimactic, but very great to see that it was Leia and C three PO saving the day here. Um, I think I said it when I was watching the episode. I was like, oh, so this is just main character energy right now, bailing out Hera from any any real discipline. And so I was kind of I was kind of hoping we were gonna get the 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 recording of of Leia's voice. I know it wouldn't sure. really, yeah, I know it wouldn't really have served a big purpose, but I just wanted to hear it. you know, I was kind of disappointed we didn't get any sort of Carrie Fisher audio. I so it, it was it wasn't even that i wanted like c-3po's voice at the end as he's walking out to like do the the halo thing from beyond the grave like when you stick someone after they've killed you <laughs> that's what it felt like when she because her 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 like transcript was cutting so i could hear the carrie fisher we got in the later movies read that where she's like she's like if you have any problems with the missions that I assign, I recommend you take it up with me and the defense committee. Otherwise, stay in your lane and butt out of my meetings and my business. And that's what it felt like. That yeah, actually, you're. That's exactly what it felt like. Um, I also love how Mon Mothma um, saw through it immediately. You know, after she takes Hera aside, and <laughs> she's like. We bo- we both know Leia didn't didn't authorize this mission beforehand. Um, but she did eventually. Ev- it's not a lie. It's not. It's you know you're you're definitely stretching the truth. But I I appreciate that Mon Mothma of all people knows that this threat is real and how much they need to prepare. Um, and I love how the courtroom scene cuts into Ahsoka training. It was great to see Hayden um, back in his Clone Wars armor, even if it's just through a hologram. But I thought that was a really touching moment uh, between her and Huang when she, you know, when she's training. And Huang, and she, she, she admits. Um, well, one before we go on to that scene, I do like when Mon Mothma asked. Hera gave one of my personal favorite sayings, which was "Prepare for the worst, hope for the best." So. Oh, I light model, that, for sure. Yeah, I love that that's like, hey, this whole thing with Thrawn, and she's like, you need to be ready for it. Um, I, I agree. 
I, I loved the sequence where, and it felt like she was training almost like, it, it felt like that scene itself was trying to capture Tales of the Jedi when it was Anakin going like, I'll give you a test. And it was also trying to capture uh, Rebels when um, Ezra saw the holocrons and was using them to, to practice his forms. And I like how we got a little bit of that. You know, it, it felt like a cross, like maybe we hadn't seen this, but then I think at the end it, it plays like the final holocron, which is the one Ezra sees and plays in Rebels a lot. Yeah, that, and I thought it was, it, it definitely seemed like that exact um, that exact recording. I, I thought the same thing too when I was watching and I was like, oh, hey, this is one of the things that Ezra was watching in, in the um in Rebels. And I love that line back in Rebels when he when he was like, you know, I've watched these so many times, you know, it's helped with my own saber training. It's because yeah, Anakin Anakin was that guy, all right? And I love how since very little people at this like know that he was Darth Vader, I love how he's still revered when when people mention Anakin. They're like, "Oh, the Clone Wars general?" It's like, "Yeah." Good Anakin before he slaughtered all those younglings. <laughs> and I, I think it goes to show that like, cause even here, this is, this is Ahsoka really going, you know what? I'm at peace with who my master was, who he became and like, or who he was, who he became and who he actually is. And he is a good master. He like the Anakin Skywalker. I know was a good master. I also like the jab in there. Practice your forms. Yeah. More than I do. <laughs> <laughs> there there were a couple like little things in there. I'm like, that is that's the charm that I want when it comes to like, hey, this is who Anakin is. He's this great general. He's this, you know, great warrior, but as as a as a being as a person, he is also just great in himself. Good guy, Anakin. We love good, good guy, guy, Anakin. Anakin. Um, I honestly, I thought it was cool to see your see your training, and I also, I also thought for sure that we were about to get a scene where I'm thinking more so in like Game of Thrones, and you haven't seen Game of Thrones, right? I, I've caught bits and pieces. Um, well, there's um, without spoiling it, if you decide to embark on that lovely journey of, of Game of Thrones. Um, but like one of the main characters finally reunites with um, their family just to find out that like their family, like entire family's dead. Um, I thought we were about to get a scene like that with the Purgle. You know. Oh. They they drop out of hyperspace. I thought it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Or not really cool, because, you know, in this podcast, we're all about Save the Squails. Save the Squails. And this episode was not about saving the Squails. Obviously, Thrawn does not care about the Squails. Killed with extreme prejudice. Yeah. Excuse me, sir? That's what he says. Like, I I know. I'm like, do you not know what we're about? (laughs) Like, we need to get a save Squails on this podcast. (laughs) Um, But... That shot when Ahsoka's coming back to, uh, you know, coming back to the cockpit of the ship and they drop out of hyperspace and you just see through the teeth of the purgle, the the amber glow of, of the flames. And you find out that Thrawn managed to deploy a minefield right where they jump out of hyperspace. And I don't know if we've ever seen uh, Imperial minefields, but those things are crazy. Those those were really cool. Real quick before we go back to that scene, I told you I wanted one thing from this episode. Yeah. At the very end, Anakin goes, I am so proud of you, Ahsoka. Right? Yeah. Do you remember when Steve from Blue's Clues came back like a year or two ago? Oh, and everybody freaked yeah, freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it, all all I wanted and this can be fixed with a cameo I'm betting Hayden Christensen's on there is for Hayden Christensen in that recorded hologram version is to go. I'm so proud of you and the Jedi you've become. 
That's all I wanted him to say. So that way I could save it. Anytime I was having a hard day, I could have Anakin say, I'm so proud of you and the Jedi you've become. And it, oh. I was just like, damn it, Dave. <laughs> you were so close. Yeah. Um, we trusted yeah, he, you. You did. All right. Um, but yeah, the, the, the minefield was insane. I love that they specify that like they, because li- I think Huang says that they laid it out in the vector we drop out of hyperspace. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that when they first get there, you hear rumblings and you, and they show the teeth, but it's very obstructed. But the second those teeth open, it's crazy. And that's, I was holding my, my breath that entire scene too. Cause I was like, I don't want to see dead Pergo. Like get, oh, them out. Do I. get them out. They're such gentle beasts, you know? Um, <laughs> And and so like obviously Ahsoka and and Huang are are like trying to get out of this um are trying to get out of this whole this whole mess. And I thought the the dynamic between Huang and Ahsoka, the back and forth was beautifully uh beautifully put. I felt like it shifted and you and I now have the Ahsoka that we wanted from the Clone Wars and Rebels. Yeah, from the get-go. And I thought Yeah. I mean, you know, when you when you go back and you look at Ahsoka in general throughout the series, you get to see why we're seeing her now, as opposed to the first couple of episodes, because I remember everybody when the first two episodes premiered, everybody was freaking out because they were like, Oh, this isn't Ahsoka. This isn't how she acts. You know, this is, this is horrible. Like she's not showing any emotion. And well, yeah, because she was a broken character to start the series. So that's why that happens. Um, so to see her, you know, laughing, smiling, joking around, uh, making Huang's life harder was was really fun to see. I also thought Huang had a lot of really great one-liners this episode, too. Um, in that same thing, they did the meme where uh, I think Huang says something and she goes, how? I was taught how uh, to, like, not follow standard Jedi protocol. And I was like, oh, you guys, you guys made the meme. Yay. <laughs> He, he was oh he was great um I, I the the whole the whole dialogue between Huang and Ahsoka when Huang's essentially like like oh hey at least the whales are providing cover with the with like the magnetic mines um I felt like that was just a little a little Little in poor taste, you ink. And then I love immediately after he said that thing, they they go back into hyperspace. Yes, they're like, we don't have to deal with this minefield. All right, we can we can get out of here, lickety split, and they do. And um, <laughs> right after that, it brings back the the starfighters from from the uh, hyperspace rig, which are just pea shooters. I really don't like those fighters. I like the design of them, but they are the most ineffective uh, starfighter I've ever seen. They look like they're trying to be like the Naboo starfighter, but uh, they lack the firepower, though. As you yeah. can, see, as you can see, I mean, you know, yeah it it took one of them like it took Ahsoka deflecting two blasts of them to like be knocked off a ship. Yep. So in space and zero gravity, yeah. Um, I also Huang. They I like how they also made the the joke for um. What are the odds? And he's like, no, the odds are terrible. Yeah, <laughs> literally the worst. I, there <laughs> were a lot of really me? good like. I I did love a lot of the like really good like. Hey, here's here's a lot of old school Star Wars jokes with the Ahsoka that like it, it felt like a good blend to yeah. really solidify. This is the Ahsoka that you know, and and love from the the Clone Wars. Uh, so I, the dialogue in that scene, aside from the action, I think made the scene more than like the, the suspense or, oh my God, what's going to happen? Yeah. It, um, I think you're right. Definitely with the, uh, with the odds joke that I thought that was really well done because we always get like the, just the odds or, or like Han saying like, you know, like, don't tell me the odds for it. 
Mm-hmm. But I love how, like, Hugh Hank's been around the block. He he knows a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. And he's like, no, these odds are awful. Are you kidding me? Like, I didn't live 25,000 years to be blown up in a different galaxy from some Imperial minds. Like, are you joking? Like, I don't want to go into, like, purgle decay. He's a, he's a civilized droid, right? You know, he's lived this long because he doesn't get himself in situations like this. Um... But during this scene, I love how you really got to see Thrawn kind of playing commander. And I really, I really loved like his little command center on, um, on Peridia. I thought, I thought it was very well done. I hate how the holograms are, are done. I thought it's very disgusting. It kind of almost feels like buggy. You know, you mean, are, are you talking about how like everything kind of like assimilates? Yeah. And so go ahead. It's just, I, it's just, ugh. it gives me the heebie jeebies. It's okay. like an evil, it's an evil way to, to do a hologram and I hate it. <laughs> okay. So I wasn't sure if you were like, I don't like the way, like, I don't like the way they look. I feel, I thought that they were, cause it feels like one with the Zepho writing and the like, the the Zepho writing being like praise Kujet, the the dark one, um, it makes me feel like this is ancient, like simulated with the Force, and like the instead of the hologram being technology, it's like old Force magic technology. So that's why it builds up, and it just feels a little creepy and off because it's like forcibly manipulated in that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, you said it perfectly. Ugh, it just, you're, uh, it just, ugh. I, I like, it almost made me skin crawl a little bit seeing it, you know? Yeah, I can feel that. Um, but yeah, what did you think of, what did you think of Thrawn? Like, I, he, he's such a, he's such a good villain and I hate it. <laughs> um, I, I loved, uh, I, I enjoyed Thrawn being there. Um, I know Mrs. Play, because we, we talked about this on the ride home, she had a couple points where she felt like Thrawn's, Thrawn coming in kind of like diminished other characters. Uh, we'll get that to a little bit later on. Um, but I love how before when Thrawn did things, like he was calculated, but he knew he had the resources to spare. The biggest thing I go to is... Um, there's a point in Rebels where they're tr- he's trying to find uh, the Rebel army that's been harassing Lothal where no one else can, and it, it, it's supposed to be that like one of those funny like ha ha the two side characters. Um, a probe droid gets there uh, to the base. You learn that it's like a transforming assault droid that has a lack of a better words like a, a nuclear bomb inside of it. To oh, detonate. that thing was menacing. And they get it reprogrammed and send it back to the ship. And it gets in the ship and they're like, and, you know, the the inside mole for the Empire is like, you know, good job, guys, because it it blows up inside one of the enemy. It blows up inside of a Star Destroyer. So you got to think, like, that's not an insignificant amount of people. That is easily an advanced landing force that could land on a planet. It it crippled a fleet by at least a tenth if there are ten ships in there, like. It is, it is a, it's like us losing an aircraft carrier today. Yeah, exactly. Beautifully and said the, too. And at the end of the episode that the mole goes, oh, well, it's a, it's a real shame that that happened. And, you know, trying to like, you know, suss out what, what Thrawn's thinking. Thrawn goes on the contrary. Like I now know that they came from one of these planets. Yeah. And he goes, I had 500 and now I'm down to 15. And it's just like, fuck. Mm-hmm. Or it was down to 50. <laughs> because that's that's how Thrawn always goes even when you think he's lost he's won in a way he yes. manages to he manages to manages to eke out victories even in defeat which is which sucks it, which is why I like him as a character but he always he always adapts to his opponent mm-hmm. um, and it actually brought my favorite Thrawn interaction up so far is when him and Morgan Elsbeth are are talking about you know they got the file on Ahsoka while Ahsoka's hiding in the um in the 
in the purgle remains the um what do you call the ring around the planet the debris no uh, oh, it's it's Field? like a Saturn, a Saturn's rings. Yeah, like it, it just has purgle remains in it. Exactly. Um, and when they're talking about that, you know, they finally get the the file from what they said. They file was from like the Inquisitor's database, right? Yeah, it was at the Inquisitorial database. Which it blows my mind that the Empire still has access to all of their databases and everything. Like you thought, a lot of that would have been dismantled. But also, I don't know how storage works for systems in in star wars so i'm glad they just had that on a backup file somewhere and you know it's mentioned that that her master was anakin and and thrawn pauses and you can see for a moment like the the fear in his in his eyes and he's like her master was general anakin skywalker and it, and you know, Morgan's like, yeah, why? You know, <laughs> like it's just another Jedi. And he's like, this one is going to be very dangerous, and will do just about anything. Essentially, is what he was trying to get across. It's like we need to be prepared for anything to happen. Uh, it's not, you know, Ahsoka's not somebody to be underestimated. Which, considering the line of Jedi that she comes from, I'd say that's a that's a pretty fair thing to say. Yeah. Because I, I feel that Morgan up to this point has underestimated Ahsoka, as so many do. I, yeah, and and, and that really got called out. Sorry, I was I was trying to think about this because I'm, I'm replaying the conversation with Mrs. Play. I miss this play since you've been listening to these. Thank you for being the supportive Mrs. that you are. Um, the uh, there's a her biggest complaint for this episode because she will flat out say like she did not like this episode is that Morgan went from being someone who is competent and capable to being the I ask dumb questions so that Thrawn can explain what he's doing for for the audience um and because I, I asked and I talked to you, I was like, what did, what has she really done aside from fight, you know, Ahsoka with a spear and not do anything well to get to this planet? She freely admits that the, the grand, the great mothers were the whole reason she got there. And I kind of feel like Thrawn would have like given her all the business choices. This is what you need to do to win. These are the patterns and like made her feel like she was doing it. But I never once felt like she was a, she was like relegated. She was, yeah, and she she feels really relegated here, but like even when we found her in the Mandalorian, I felt like she was like she was a villain of the episode, a villain of the week for back in the day. Um, yeah, when when Mando was full of villains of the week. Yeah. And so I I love how like cunning Thrawn is. And I'm I'm trying to see it like is is Morgan being relegated because of this? Because in the last episode, you know, he sits there. Or she goes like, oh, Lord Balin absor- assured me that she'd been killed. And you even pointed out last time she had been killed, but they came back. and It's kind of the Jedi shtick. Um, and so I, I don't know, like I, I'm, I'm seeing Mrs. Play's point of view of, hey, you know, was she just relegated or or was she actually like a good a good character yeah and i think it's more so just the introduction of thrawn than anything because thrawn like morgan's entire mission has been focused on finding thrawn because he's the heir to the empire like that's that's been her entire mission and so like she's she's thrawn's subordinate at the end of the day like she's Thrawn's second in command so um i mean i think I agree with Mrs. Play to an extent, but I think it's more so that she's she was able to act as the as the top dog earlier in the series because she was the top dog. But with Thrawn, I mean that's her boss at at the end of the day. That's the entire reason she made this hyperspace ring and and jumped to this part of you know jumped to another galaxy was to find him because he's the guy who can put everything back together. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I mean that's how, that's kind of how I felt 
you know, for that. Um, yeah, I thought I didn't, I didn't really have a problem with it personally. I, I personally didn't either, but I am trying to see it from, uh, Mrs. Plays from a certain point of view. Yeah. From, from a certain point of view. Uh, (laughs) so yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know how I feel about like her character. I, I, I do think that like because of our like this is like my backgrounds personally with like work and me being prior service and things like that that like some things didn't need to be ex- uh, ex- um, explained. So I'm gonna ask you a question, um, mm-hmm. just because I want the the outsiders' uh, perspective. We're gonna we're gonna jump to the the end of the of the show. Did you understand what Thrawn's plan was? with what he was doing to Ahsoka and the gang uh, when he devised his plan before he told her, before he told Morgan at the end. Oh, 100%. Okay. Uh, Because this always has been a race against time for, for our crew. Uh, Because at the end of the day, they don't have another way to get back to the other galaxy. As far as we know, as far as we know, Um, as Thrawn said in the last episode, uh, what he said was it three rotations that he said it was, or was it just three days? I think it was three rotations. He said three rotations, and like he told Sabine point blank, like three rotations, and I'm out. So like you, you can get stuck here forever. Good luck finding your friend Sayonara. Uh, won't miss you. So I thought it, I thought it was perfect. His plan because it's a Thrawn plan, and they rarely go awry. Yep. Um. But yeah, I definitely understood. I don't think I understand what he's bringing back. I'm sure we'll learn more about this cargo that he's loading. Um, But his goal definitely this episode was just to waste more of their time while loading this mysterious cargo so that they can can skedaddle off the planet. Yeah, I... I agree. I just I wasn't sure if you knew what it was before they they said that, um, but uh, yeah. So that was that was my plan. That that was just my question there because I was like, oh, you'll be you were about as far removed from what Mrs. Play and I and how like our lives have been uh, as as could possibly be as, as far as like growing up. Um, going back through my notes, uh, how did okay so. Uh, Ahsoka is coming through the minefield. Uh, she hides the. Uh, she hides the minefield. Eludes all the sem- sensors. The. Night- felt, I was gonna say it felt very uh, Empire Strikes Back asteroid oh, field ask. It was definitely pulled from Empire. It it really did. I felt like a lot of this was like even like the the don't tell me the odds flying through a minefield like an asteroid field. It all felt that. Um, which which I'm not mad about because Empire is one of the greatest constructed movies of all time. And definitely, I will not hear any debate on this. It was the greatest sequel to a movie ever. So there's, I agree. My, there's my two cents. Anyway, um, <laughs> I think John and I, John John's a friend of, uh, of both of ours. Him and I share the same sentiment that Empire Strikes Back as a, as a standalone movie is one of the greatest cinematic masterpieces of the entire human, human existence. So I agree. I, 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 it is, I like, like the kid in me likes it because I, I thought Hoth is still the coolest, the coolest sequence for uh, all of star Wars. Oh, it's so cool. Um, and that, that's just like me personally, like there, nothing will ever, ever go over that. Uh, so Ahsoka finds, um, uh, how, how did you feel about how Ahsoka contacted Sabine? Um, I thought it was well done. And I think Huang giving the assistance of like, do you of saying like, do you really think your bond's strong enough? I think me as the, as the viewer was also asking that question. Um, it's, it's almost, I guess it, it's different than Leia finding Luke in in Empire. Also, another thing lifted from Empire, by the way. Uh, I think you'll be able to do that 
as a Jedi with anybody you have a strong enough connection with. Because you're reaching out through the Force, and even if you're not Force sensitive, I still think, like I still think, somebody with a strong enough connection would be able to feel that. You know what I'm saying? I I agree. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this uh, a little bit. I think had the previous two episodes of Ahsoka's growth not happened, never would have worked. Definitely, one hundred percent. Um, two. This brings me to a very important. Uh, question where it's like Luke and Leia you kind of get uh, it, it kind of does it because it's like oh you, you're actual twins and you're twins in the force so you're, you're yes. four sensitive twins who are biological twins not just like diodes right and, and also I think you can make the case that Leia is also one of the most powerful force users or ever? could could have been one of the most powerful force users ever yes so here, here's here's a quick question that's going to be a little off topic, but I just want to hear a quick thought on you for this. When Vader calls out to Luke at the end of Empire Strikes Back as well, because he does, was that Anakin Skywalker, the man, understanding that Luke is his son and that the point where Anakin realizes he can no longer be Darth Vader? or that he is not Darth Vader? Or was that just Darth Vader, like, in himself? Like, part oh. of me now watches that scene so, wants to see that scene so differently. Like, that is Anakin Skywalker relinquishing the Force to his son. Wow. Because Great after question. That, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I'm, I'm with you. It, I think it's Anakin and, because we very rarely have seen moments where Anakin comes through as Darth Vader. Very, very few moments. Um, one being in Rebels, Anakin shines through when he's fighting Ahsoka. Yes. Um, which also, every time I watch that scene, I get goosebumps. Every time. That was one of the most mind-blowing scenes I've ever s- witnessed. Um, another time is during Obi, you know, during the Obi-Wan series. Um, no, actually, I think that was still Darth. Well, I think Obi-Wan I, was Darth. Yeah. I think that was supposed to be, I think that one was uh, Darth Vader trying to be like, absolving no, I, him of, of his blame. Yeah, of yeah. the guilt he feels. Um, but the other time is that there's a really good Darth Vader comic series. They do a great job with Vader in the comics, by the way. Um, they do. He essentially is trying to resurrect Padme and then gets tricked by was was an old Sith Lord, I think, on, on Mustafar. It's like uh, the with one the mask. That was, yes, the, the one that was in the mask and then he puts on somebody else. Yeah. And, yeah. Um. And so, like, you definitely see these inklings of Anakin, who was such a broken man at, after after his duel with Obi Wan. Um, I definitely think that was that was Anakin reaching out to to Luke through the Force, um, which probably starts the really grand conflict in him that you see a spot, you know, like that you see happening during uh, Return of the Jedi. Which, again, um, I think in terms of just the the original trilogy. I think for me, it's empire strikes back return of the Jedi and then a new hope. Just put, put my rankings out there on the internet. Um, uh, I'm, I'm reversing new hope and return of the Jedi, but yeah, okay. I understand. Okay. Anyway, it, it was the Ewoks, wasn't it? Because of the Ewoks. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, of Obi-Wan. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I think especially as I've gotten older, I think if I were, you know, I think if I were 10 years younger, I would still say probably Return of the Jedi, but I think the dialogue for for episode four is so important that that's fair. really what steers it, seals it for me. That's fair. Um, but getting back to Ahsoka, because yep. you know on this podcast we love to get off topic. You know, We mentioned one Star Wars thing, and it'll send me down a tangent. Um, I loved the scenes between Ezra and Sabine. It, it felt straight out of Rebels. Um, I'm blanking on the actor's name who portrays Ezra, but he is spot on. 
I think I think he's adapted the character more so than anybody else in this show. Uh, Thrawn included, actually. I think this is exactly a spitting image of what we would see from Ezra um, had you just made Rebel Season 2 in an animation, you know? Aman Esfandi, who yeah. was also Aladdin. Uh, shout out to Aman, you're a, an amazing actor. Hats off to you. Um, I loved how <laughs> I loved how we got the line from Ezra when you know a, when Sabine's trying to recap everything that had happened leading up to this point and how she got there, mm-hmm. and and Sabine's like, "Yeah, Ahsoka took me on as her apprentice," <laughs> and Ezra. <laughs> Ezra's instinctively like you really I mean congratulations yeah I was like yeah that's Ezra never was the greatest with uh being diplomatic about that sort of thing but, yes uh, he's like I know you trained a little bit like when I was still training and I was like yeah she did but I thought that that plays into the whole Ezra in that scene was the viewer you know yes um, so I thought that, I thought that was a, a, a great little piece of, of connecting the dots. Um, and, and I love the, I love the whole Noti tribes, little caravan too. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're little, uh, shells, I guess is, is what you call them. They're little pods. Um, I, I love seeing Ezra, which makes me so terrified about what's to come in this next episode, because he's like, maybe I am going home. And I feel like every time you hear that from a character, they die. And like I said, and I've said on this podcast, nobody has plot armor because none of them are around, save for the ghost in Rise of Skywalker. None of them around are around in the sequels. So... You know, I'm um, I'm worried for him. I now I'm worried for him. I you have said that like two episodes now, and I think I keep trying to tune it out to a point of like no, like I I do think that in the final movie, um, Ahsoka will ultimately sacrifice herself, and I think with the third uh, Star Wars, you know, Jedi game coming out um, that Cal will like kind of go to a distant galaxy to get people away. Kind of like, you know, uh, where Zeb's people went. Yeah. Um, to, uh, uh, was it Aurelio? No. Well, it's like, it's Kobo. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the place of bond in, in, um, out towards, uh, the, un- the unknown, the wild. Yeah, yeah. space. Yeah. Um, I, I think Ahsoka, by the end of all of this, will she will die. In, in I would service. expect to at this point, you know, especially because her voice was heard. And I know this isn't like the end all be all, but her voices was one of the voices heard in Rise of Skywalker. Yes. Um, and also, like, she's just getting up there in age at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I expect her because you got to think she's got, you know, 20 years on Luke at this point. She's yeah. late thirties, early forties. Yeah, she's she's um, not old, but like oh, she's, she's old. She's getting older for a, a Jedi and to be doing what she's doing. Um, that sounds really bad out of context. Um, but yeah, no, it, it kind of bummed me out. I don't like. I like Ezra. I I liked Ezra by the end of Rebels. I love and, him now. I thought in this older Ezra that we've been getting, we haven't gotten a lot of him. Um, but he seems more in tune with himself. He's had almost, what, 10 years or so to to really commune with with the Force, which you see on display in this episode, too, which I thought was really cool. Other than the line, I was so excited. So, uh, of course, what ends up happening is uh, they're riding along the caravan, doing the catch-up thing, and right before Sabine can really kind of uh, explain like what's going on and like how she got there, um, they get attacked by friends of Sabine's uh, that may or may not wield lightsabers. 
uh, and the band of like marauders that go with them. Mm -hmm. And Ezra, like, you know, they try to get away. Sabine's doing her blaster thing. The, the Toki people are using like the, the slingshots that don't really work. Oh, they don't, they don't work at all. The one throws a cast iron pan at a guy, and you know he. Falls <laughs> off. I thought I I love this little tribe. It sucks that we're not going to see a lot more of them, but they're adorable. I I kind of hope they go with them. Like they they're just like we'll come along with you, and they just walk between. Like they're like oh yeah, we can just walk between this two area. Yeah. Um, but I I also love the fact that, like, so they circle up, and Ezra like tells them all to get inside. I'm going to, I'll defend you. You know, it'll, it'll be okay. Sabine and I, and Sabine is constantly like, she's like, take your lightsaber. And he's like, no, I gave it to you. It's yours. It's not mine. <laughs> Which yeah. goes back to Huang. Um, but, uh, one of the things that I, I, I do, I, I love is that, and Mrs. Plague had a problem with the dialogue. He's like, the force is my ally. And he starts fighting using more traditional Japanese Kenpo, like, Kenpo can be used for both boxing or ja like Japanese like fist fighting as well as a sword fighting. So it felt really cool that he's doing some movements that if you put a lightsaber in his hand, they would have been similar. But then without it, he's doing just as well. Well, you, you got to think, like I said, he's been trapped here without a lightsaber, commuting with the force, trying to survive. You have all of that time to really focus in on yourself, you know, quiet the distractions, feel the living force, as Qui-Gon would say. Like, you had all this time to really balance yourself, I'd say is the best way to say it. So, of course, he'd be strong with the force because he he was at peace with himself at the end of Rebels, making that decision to take Thrawn out of the equation of the Galactic Civil War, which was, I'd argue, one of the biggest decisions that he could have made because Thrawn in the original trilogy would have shredded everything up. The Rebellion would not have been able to handle him. Correct. Yeah. So he was already at peace making that decision. So it makes sense that he spent the last 10 years essentially at at peace. You know, he knew that his friends were going to find him at some point or another, that they were somehow or some way going to find him. And that was only a matter of time. And uh, I, yeah, I, him being at peace, him using the force as someone who just got the force counter in um, Jedi Survivor, the fact that like people were coming at him and he was just like a little bit of the force to, it wasn't quite the subtlety that like Vader did when he was fighting the, the fifth sister, or the seventh sister, where uh, he was like, oh, I'm going to quickly throw. Like, you mean he the was, show like, but it was Vader's movements felt because it's like you said, when people get older, Jedi get older, they kind of revert to form one mm -hmm. and Vader, like she's coming in like, like full on swinging with all of her might. And you know, from coming from like a uh, firefly or, or serenity, if any of you guys have ever watched that series, um, the one person teaching the captain how to sword fight goes, it takes less than a pound of pressure to break the skin. And when she's fighting, she's like coming on with all of her might, and he's just like pushing her away slightly, just raising it. Whereas when we see Ezra doing it, it doesn't look like he's doing a lot, but he is like throwing them and it looks like he's exerting a little bit more energy. So he feels stronger in the force, but coming off of Obi-Wan, I can still see like, hey, as strong as Ezra's gotten this is how good Darth Vader was. And I, I think that was like a really cool, if you were to compare those scenes and that type of fighting back to back. Yeah. Um, I still thought it was, it was really, it was really well done. Um, I kind of, so actually I wanted to ask you about that, that fight scene real mm -hmm. quick as, as it, as it kind of happens, you know, they're facing off against the Marauders. I loved, I love how we see Sabine, uh, continuing to use both her Jedi and Mandalorian fighting styles. I think that yes. makes her a much more, um, much more effective fighter overall. But um, what did you think about the exchange between Shin and Balin? Like, did it, did it feel like master abandoning apprentice to you? 
Like I, we we made the comment last last week on the pod that it kind of feels like Shin's not on board with this whole thing as much as she as she was at the start of the series, and I can't help but think that that we're really starting to see her faith in Balin shaken. All right. So yes, I actually, I have this in my little notebook next to me. Um, so what, what happens is like when, when they get to the fight, um, Balin, uh, looks at, at it and goes, Hey, go, go forth, go with them, capture them, kill them, whatever you have to do and take your place in the seat of this new empire. Uh, you, he, I think he literally says like your ambition is taking you in a direction that I cannot go and I'm going another way before you leave though. I'm going to pass off one last piece of advice, my apprentice. And it was like rushing for victory ensures defeat. I think is it's somewhere yep. along those lines. And that felt like. Because Balin said, I, I trained you to be something more. And so that makes me think that Balin maybe trained her with a little bit more of Sith teachings. Um, even though like he himself is like, I don't sense even the rage that I would get from Dooku occasionally or, or anyone else. It feels like he is a Jedi who just has very, very different beliefs uh, then, then uh, like Ahsoka, or a traditional Jedi, I think you're right. He he no longer felt a need for for Shin because he doesn't even. The thing is, he goes, "I have one last like lesson for you," but not, "Hey, you've done very well as my Padawan." It wasn't like Obi Wan, you know, trying to take on Anakin, going like Obi Wan's ready for the trials. He's been ready for a long time. He's a better. There was none of that. This was resignation of, even if it's. I think like Shin has failed me, and I don't think I have any more use for her. But no, he totally abandoned her. Oh, one hundred percent. And and that's where it's going from there. <laughs> and I also thought it was interesting. So you know, like Ahsoka. And Huang are in atmosphere, of course. Um, <laughs> I love how Huang just gets left out to dry. Like, hey, pilot the ship. Ship. Good luck with these fighters. Uh, so, you know, Ahsoka breaks the standard Jedi protocol. Um, and it's funny because she drops off the starship. And who does she run into almost immediately? Balin. And I love how <laughs> I love how Balin's like so surprised kind of kind of like a didn't i kill you already like what do you i didn't expect to see you here um i was kind of surprised that we were getting a rematch of them so soon to tell you the truth um it felt i don't want to say anticlimactic but it felt kind of rushed in a way well so and th- this is this brought me back to kind of like spelling it out uh cuz this felt almost like something from from Clone Wars and even even Kenobi where it was she's like I'm not here to fight you I'm here because I need your ride and I can't have you win yeah so she she beats him and it felt like one of those things because he goes you can't win and she's like per she's like yes or perhaps or maybe mm-hmm. but then again I don't need to and then just steals steals the ride. Like to me, yeah. that that felt like a I need answers from you because what who are you? What are you? So she has to rescue her friends, and she needs him to be close by. So it felt like that was a dual purpose thing. Like she didn't want to beat him because she had other priorities, and two, she's like I still have questions for you, <laughs> and and because you're here alone, I know that you're not going back to Thrawn. And it, I thought it was also, I thought it was really funny. It, that's actually my, my favorite sequence in, in the show or in this episode, because, you know, Ahsoka times it perfectly, steals, steals his mouth. And then you see Balin, like not expecting it <laughs> at all. 
and he looks exactly like um, you've seen Pulp Fiction, right? Yes. Yeah, because everybody's seen Pulp Fiction, I feel like, at this point. Um, but John Travolta, like the really funny meme of John Travolta, where he's like looking around. Oh, the yeah, the, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I thought I thought that's exactly what Balin looked like in this. Like he's just he wasn't expecting to get he got Grand Theft Mounted, I guess. Grand Theft. No, I like Grand Theft Mounted works. Yeah, Grand Theft Mounted, and <laughs> like he just he just wasn't expecting this to happen. Um, and then it gets it gets it goes back to Thrawn. Um, and I think he had said like, as long as Lord Balin delivers, we're fine. And then it goes back to him a few minutes later after he gets, you know, he gets Mount jacked and he notices, he's like, Hey, our side's missing somebody. Where's yeah, Lord it's Balin? Missing a, it's missing a, a mercenary, which one, it looks like there are little holograms on the ground. So I don't know how he could tell that. He just knows. Yeah. I, guess. I, I that part I was like, okay. Um, the, one of the things that I like about that is that felt like a when Ahsoka showed up, it felt like a complete reversal because when Ahsoka found Balin, Balin talked to her and then she she like turned on the lightsaber and he goes inevitable. And then this time it felt like Balin switched sides to it. Yeah. And he was the aggressor and Ahsoka like Ahsoka pulled an Anakin because she like stretches out and like you see her with the lightsabers. Then she does like the kind of like, come on, guy, like just come at me. We know you're going to. And it it felt like, hey, you saw this in act one and now we're seeing it in act three. But we're switching the sides so that way you can see, you know, the growth in one character and the possible degradation of another. Yeah, that I. I think that also just shows how how confused he was that Ahsoka was back. Like, didn't I, you know, it goes back to the whole, like, didn't I kill you? Like, you were dead. Like, I didn't expect to see you again. So, obviously, this is, as the Night Sisters, or as the Great Mothers like to put it, you know, this is a loose thread right here. Um, <laughs> great. You put it really well. Um, I definitely think that that was, like, the... the you know, degradation of of Balin a bit. I thought I've I've seen as somebody who's who's been in touch with the greater picture and he's calculated, but that was not a calculated Balin move there. You know, um, I I loved that we finally got an Ahsoka Sabine uh, Ezra reunion. Yes, and. You know, Ahsoka comes in in the nick of time. They're they're really going at it. They're they're fighting the the night troopers, and it gets to the point where Thrawn's like, "Is no. that what they're called?" Yeah. Oh, you didn't know they were called night troopers? No, that's a really dope name. Continue. Oh, it's badass. Yeah, they're called night troopers. It's insane. Um, oh yeah, they, they are totally living dead. They are not. They are they are totally man. undead thing. Um, but it, so it gets to the point where Thrawn's like, "All right, that's enough." You know, we. He didn't want Ahsoka to be reunited with them, which is a loss. But he's like, this has served our greater purpose. You know, they've lost something that they can't afford to, time. Which, as it was stated in the last episode, you know, they only have a limited amount of time before Thrawn gets the heck out of this galaxy. With whatever cargo he's carrying, which I'm sure we'll learn, we have to learn in the last episode. Which I'm sad sad that we're coming to the end, too. I, I, they said it was a crypt. Yeah, they, the cat, they mentioned the catacombs, right? Yeah, those are caskets. Yeah, but to what purpose do they serve? You know, I'm, I'm betting, I'm betting there aren't that many night sisters, and this is kind of a resurrecting we, the culture, or yeah, like literally, like probably some like preserved mummified bodies, and if we go back to Dathomir, we can. One, we can give you the sisters, like, we can help you build an army of undead troopers or night troopers, and then two, uh, we can resurrect our sisters and maybe... Because the other thing we don't know is what happens to all the other night brothers. Like, we know that Marin's left at the end of Jedi... Uh, Jedi Fallen Order, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But all, almost all the other night sisters around her are dead, 
Yeah. And then the Knight Brothers were under Malikos. So if this that game is canon, there aren't that many Knight Sisters, and we don't necessarily know about the Knight Brothers. And yeah, uh, Fallen Order is canon, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great point, but I also think it's... It's going to serve the purpose like almost every other Star Wars show at this point is going to serve is propping up the sequel trilogy. And so if I had to guess something about those remains is going to impact how Palpatine returned. I almost feel like every show is justifying that line from Poe Dameron, like somehow Palpatine returned and like, this is the somehow, you know? Um, oh yeah, it's if it if it's not like the exact cloning from uh what uh what's his name was doing in the Mandalorian and someone else was working on cloning as well. Yeah. It's Yeah, like all of the pieces serve the greater puzzle. Yeah. Um but overall, like I said, I loved the reunion between so, you know between Ezra and Ahsoka particularly because Ahsoka owes her entire life to Ezra. Yes. All of it. And actually to a to a lesser extent, uh Sabine. Because Sabine's the entire reason they figured out how to open the portal. So, shout out to Sabine. Lover of art. <laughs> Got this whole thing kicked off. Um, Before we get to the, the end end, because we're pretty much there. Um, so, there was there was a brief scuffle between uh, Sabine, Ezra, and Shin. Yes. Did you see anything weird happen to Shin's lightsaber? At, one, it also feels like everyone can block a lightsaber with the Force nowadays. Um, happened Jedi Fallen Order. Like, it, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this with like the Jedi barrier doing that. But did you, did you notice anything happened to Shin's lightsaber when Ezra blocked it with the Force? Uh, no, not that I, not that I recall. Anyway, the blade flickers and kind of warps a little bit, almost as someone had like taken their hands. And wrapped it and started squeezing it to like physically put like it looked like he literally reached with the force and grabbed it like holding it in his fists because the blade kind of wavers almost like a flame. Who, uh, who in Fallen Order could do that? The lightsaber. Oh, um, it was uh, 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 uh the, the was it one of the Inquisitors? No, it wasn't the. No, it was um, Siri. Oh, the the master, the... yeah, Sarah Jun. Yeah, she she creates like a little barrier to stop Vader at the very end. Spoilers. Um, I love how you say spoilers after that. Uh, yeah, but also if you haven't played Fallen Order at this point or watched something, I mean, it's been what like five, four years, three, uh, two thousand nineteen. It's been yeah, it's four been years. over four years. So, Great, let's play on the channel. Fantastic, let's play on the channel. By the way, um, so. I can't explain away I can't explain away hers. But other times you see it with with um Anakin, for instance, it's Anakin. Yeah. Um you could see it to an extent with Kylo. I don't know if he has actually deflected a lightsaber like that, but I know he's done the same thing with blaster bolts and also I'd argue he comes from the Skywalker lineage, so powerful force user. Um, and he he does like freeze the bolt, which was cool because it's like the first time we'd ever really seen. <laughs> yeah, that thing was crazy. <laughs> yeah, like that that entire scene. But yeah, I don't I don't know something something about like him stopping a blaster to me feels different. I, yeah, like it's 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 a lightsaber. It's a mythical weapon I, for a more civilized it, time. So <laughs> nice, <laughs> good drop there. So I think it comes into two things here, right? Is that. Shin is not trained well enough. That's what that's one part of this whole equation, right? The second thing is that we get back to Ezra being in another galaxy for the past 10 years, having time to hone his you know, hone his skills with the force. Like that's a lot of time to just be on your own to really master what you've been taught. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's my second point. And my third point is I think a reason you don't see it a lot during the Clone Wars or or the prequels especially is that, you know, I think Yoda says it, or maybe it was Mace Windu, but it was their dialogue in, 
either the end of Phantom Menace or the start of the Clone Wars, where they essentially said their ability to use the Force is diminished because of the the cloud of the dark side. Because of Palps. Like, that's that's kind of where I, I explain away why we don't see it a lot in the prequels. Um, but I honestly think that Ezra's gifted... Um, and has had time to really hone that skill because you got to think he's only had the force to rely on as a weapon this entire time. Yeah. Also, I'm going to, I'll bring up one other theory before, uh, before um, we sign off here. Yeah. Before, before we get to the end, because I got like two questions. Um, Ezra sits there and tells Sabine like, Hey, I don't need my lightsaber. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's even, really funny. even knowing that two people who are up there are probably force users that use lightsabers. So did he not need it because he's like, no, I gave it to you. Like that, like I like, or, you know, like kind of like that. Or was this Ezra saying, yeah, I don't need a lightsaber to fight them when I need <laughs> a lightsaber. I'll get one. You mean Chad Ezra? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a little bit of both, but I was, I think it was mainly just Swole's the first rough. one. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> oh. Um. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> that was terrible. Uh, um, was. I think it was a little bit of both, but I think it was mainly just, as you said, Hewing's point. Like, he gave his lightsaber to Sabine. He didn't, he didn't need it. Um, I wish he would have taken it, though. I want to see, I want to see Ezra absolutely shred with one. Um, but I just hope we keep Ezra around. Don't kill him off. We just got him back. So I have a theory. Don't don't do this. To, if it's any theory that involves Ezra dying, I don't want to hear it. No, it, it's not. It not right away, at least. I, I can't. You're right. I can't account for him. However, you know something that we haven't seen in live action. What? A traditional Jedi or a Jedi traditionally assembling their lightsaber. Oh, I'd love to see that from Ezra. So I I think Ezra and Hugh Ang Hugh Ang even goes I hope I live to see the end of this which <laughs> made me think that he's going to be the one that dies by the end. Yeah, of the he and I'm you know as the number one Hugh Ang stand on the face of this planet I can't believe I didn't mention that during the podcast I was yeah. very worried. Don't kill my favorite droid and I mean he's my I love Chopper I love R two but I think Hugh Ang is is my favorite droid that's out there. I, I can see that. Um. He's but, uh, just so old and knowledgeable and old. <laughs> Very I, old. I, I think that Ezra will stay alive because I think he and Huang are he's this is gonna be how Huang like teaches somebody else to teach them how to build a lightsaber. Uh because Ezra's never built a classic lightsaber. All of his have been a little bit different. Yeah, thrown together. And then secondly, um, I know Mrs. Play had a had a problem with how quickly Ahsoka forgave Sabine. I chalked it up to Oh no, not at all because they they went over this in the last episode and let me let you finish actually before I I go on this tangent. I I chalked it up to Ahsoka had to grow, like had Ahsoka not passed Anakin's test? No, there would have been scolding, there would have been everything like making Sabine out to be like, you know, hey, you're you're bad, you're a bad student, this, that, the other. I took it as, no, this is Ahsoka realizing I did not prepare Sabine for this. Sabine made the best call. Even Huang said, like, the Force gives us insight. It does not give us answers. And two, yeah. Sabine did find Ezra. So Sabine did make the right call. Exactly. exactly. And as it was stated in the last episode, she made the only choice she had. At the time. Yes. And uh, there was this interesting theory uh, that I read online last week that maybe this is Sabine's way of saying that, like, oh, my God, my master is dead. I have to carry on this mission somehow and prevent them from from returning Thrawn. You know, like that's that's kind of I kind of subscribe to that theory a little bit. But I was really. um. I was really bummed that this episode wasn't a bit longer. It definitely, it's the setup. But I hate how we just got the gang back together and we have one episode left in the series. And like I said, I worry for all of their health and safety. I'm like, I'm like the mom 
of the ghost crew. You know, I don't want any, I don't want any, uh, anybody to kick the bucket. You know, I'm not ready for it. I agree. I, uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think Ezra will be there too. Cause I think Ezra or, or Ahsoka will ultimately have to sacrifice themselves to defeat Thrawn. Yeah. But um, Ezra needs to, Ezra needs to be around the train Jace. He's the only one that can do it. So then that would be, that would be the other thing would be Ezra, ah- ah- Ahsoka sacrificing herself by the end of the series and Ezra taking up the mantle to cha- to to be another Jedi Master, along with Sabine to raise moral Jedi, if yeah. not full force sensitive ones. Yeah, I I need it. I need it for my mental health. <laughs> I agree. Um, you have anything else in this episode? Sorry. No, honestly, uh, like I said, I just wish it were longer. I'm really sad that we're coming to the end of the of the first season of Ahsoka. Um, shout out to the writers who got most of what they wanted, by the way, the writer's strike, uh, ended last night. Congratulations to the SAG writers. Yes. Yes. They, I mean, to be fair though, they deserve like 10 times what they got because they are the backbone of all of the wonderful content that we got. So I'm sure with that, with the strike ending that we'll hear more about like a bad batch release date, um, Maybe maybe like January or February of next year, but I don't really know of anything lined up after Ahsoka. So, uh, Ghost Crew and Acolyte, I think, are the next. Yeah, but when? Uh, I thought uh, as of last point, it was or it was late next year. Yeah, um, well, it's too long. It's too damn long. <laughs> I agree. Good luck to the writers out there. Um, I'm sorry, the writers just got it. Good luck to the actors out there. Um, I know that they just voted for a strike, and congratulations also to the uh, VFX crew for Disney, Marvel, um, and Star Wars, also voting to unionize. Um, thank you guys yeah, so the much world for means all you unions. do. Um, also, to let you guys know, a little bit of self shilling for the channel, uh, we are doing Extra Life this year. We got about $200 raised with a $3,000 goal. So there is a hefty goal for Extra Life. Um, I will make sure that there's a link in the comments below, uh, or I will make sure there's a link in the podcast so that way you guys can donate there. Everything goes to one of our local DC Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Um, As always, if you enjoyed this, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Check out this podcast on all of your platforms on the channel. I will make sure it is up there. Stay tuned because just like uh, episode five, this one's going to have a little special thing uh, for you to, for your eyes, for your eyeballs as you're listening to it on YouTube. Um, Remember, take care of your friends here and elsewhere. You're all winners out there. Keep it weird and have a fantastic day. And night. don't uh, don't ride any space wheels that you're not friends with. They might transport you to the wrong galaxy. Or the right one. <laughs> Keep it weird. <laughs>